Well, this will be number three concerning the use of the King James. Why? I believe it's the translation that we should use. And I want to give you some reasons why I don't use all the others. And I'll give you a little bit of the reasoning behind it. I am not an expert on languages and Hebrew and Greek. That, that's Bob's job. That's what he does. But I have to have a, a reason that's clear enough in my own mind. So I can't tell you everything. I can only tell you just a few of the highlights of my, some of my reasoning. Because I uh, do believe that there is a movement on to corrupt the Word of God. And it's important to know what the Word of God says and the importance of defending the Word and defending the Gospel. And so I wanted to give you a few words on that. Take your Bible and just look with me very quickly to the um, book of 1 Corinthians. Make it 2 Corinthians. First mistake I've made tonight. 2 Corinthians in chapter 11. He makes a statement here in verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. Lest by any means as the serpent beguiled through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, that ye might, well, bear with him. He was afraid that you might listen to him. And I believe it's the same thing when we have that fear that they will, there will be people, some of God's children, people that you've led to the Lord or challenged to serve the Lord, begin to listen to other versions. And sometimes you think, you know, that version may not be, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's just a few words. Uh, just a few things were changed. But understanding how the devil works, he doesn't do it all at one time. It's here a little they're little. And you accept that. And then a little bit more. Do you think we have seen the end of all Bible versions? There should not be any more. For whatever has been said has already been said, so there can't be any more, right? It warms you up so that you are always looking for something new and better, easy to understand, one that's not as convicting or maybe uh, doesn't make you feel so uncomfortable. One that you can accept, and uh, pretty soon you'll have one just right. There won't be no hell in it, nothing about the blood. There won't be anything in it that will upset you. Uh, maybe we can just take sin out of the Bible, too, and you'd be surprised how it happens little by little. So why does Calvary Community Church use the King James Bible? This is number three. Calvary believed the King James Bible is an accurate translation from the preserved Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts. And we've mentioned this before, but we will get into a little bit more of that tonight. You needed to get a good look at the theology, you know, the goals and purposes of these men before we examine the doctrine that is affected by the changes in the modern Bible version. So if you understand where they're coming from, you'll know why they're doing what they're doing. And so it's important to know the certain men that have been instrumental in giving us a corrupt version. Now, there's liberal theologians, and they will give us a false view of God's Word. They want to present a portion of Scripture that contradicts the truth of what God's Word has to say. When you accept a little leaven, remember, just a little, the next translation will give you a little more leaven. And you don't think, well, just a little bit is not going to hurt. It's a little changes, you know, it's not going to be that bad. But small, subtle changes are not that bad, are they? Well, little by little, remember that. And so you don't just come in and change the whole word of God because nobody would accept that. 
but they're just making it easier to understand. And to do that, then they just make it flow and do it by thought. Well, we got the thought down. And so that sounds good. Now, in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, where we just read, but I fear, lest by any means, as the servant beguiled him, so your minds should be corrupted. So you see, Satan wants to corrupt our minds. And one way he can do that is to corrupt the Word of God. If he can corrupt the Word of God, now how can you corrupt the Word of God? But see, Jesus said when he came into this world, uh, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Truth. He is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So if you corrupt truth, then you must have error. See how easy that is to understand? So when you're going to corrupt a person's mind, then you corrupt the truth that they're supposed to believe. Then they do not believe truth. They believe error. But they don't know that it's error because somebody has done it very subtly without anybody being aware that it's happening. And so this is important to remember. Thus have you have the, you know, the commandment. Thus have you made the commandment of God of, and here's two words. It's actually, it's in the Bible, and Jesus said it. None effect by your tradition. Can you corrupt the word of God? You can corrupt it. And you can um, replace the word of God by tradition. Every person sitting in this room can become your own translator. You interpret it yourself. And you'll come up with whatever meaning you want it to. And many times your theology is going to be dictated by your morality, how you want to live. And so you can pick certain verses out of the Bible to prove your own way of thinking and you feel comfortable with it. And that's why when you read the scriptures, there are certain parts that you may not, well, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Well, this is all right, but I, I don't believe that. And that's why you will not let the word of God have its full impact in your life because you pick and choose and you determine what is and what is not the word of God based upon how you want to live. And so, believe it or not, Christians can get to the place where they don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. It just contains the word of God. And I can determine what it is and what it is not. So you can become your own interpreter, translate it for yourself. And how many translators would we have? If every man just believe whatever you want to believe about the Bible. And there's a lot of people that do just that. He says also in Matthew 15 and verse 9. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And he says, when you do that, you make the word of God of none. It doesn't have the effect. Truth, truth is powerful. That's why the only thing that I have that I can offer to the people at this church is truth. If I offered you nothing but lies, <laughs> I don't think many of you would want to be a part of this ministry. But somewhere along the line, you believe that what I'm teaching is from the Bible. And that's why people say, well, I, I just want somebody to go preach the word, teach the Bible. Tell me exactly what it says. And you can look and follow along and decide whether or not, is that really in there? Is that really what it says? And so you want people to believe the truth. Now, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 13, it says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition." Causing the word of God not to have effect. If the Bible said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, if you believe that, then you suppose to, if you believe, you're supposed to be saved. But if you add to the word of God something, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and keep the Ten Commandments and thou shalt be saved. Now, I said everything within it, it's all in there, but I just added something to it. But what I added causes it not to have its effect because that isn't the truth. I changed the truth of God into a lie. Now, is that wrong? 
if I give people the impression that what I said, God said, but it's not the truth, I'm deceiving. This is why every child of God should study the Word of God. But remember, he says, these things have I written unto you that keep the Ten Commandments and obey the golden rule. Yes. Now, did I add anything to it? Yes. Now, if you don't know that verse, you won't know I added anything to it. But what I added annuls the verse and the power of the verse. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may hope that you have eternal life. One little word like hope changes the meaning of the verse. It says you can know you have eternal life. So whenever you and I talk to people, did you know that there has been times when I have actually led people to the Lord and never quoted a verse? Now, you can't be saved without believing the word. It's the word of God. You've got to believe the word. And I have led many people to Christ and never quoted a scripture. Have you ever done that? You mean, can you lead somebody to the Lord without quoting the scripture? See, I have led people to the Lord because I told them the truth that was in that scripture. When I tell them that all that you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ. Now, I cannot find a verse that says it word for word exactly like I said it. But the truth has to be told. And you and I are supposed to teach the truth. And I'll show you more about that in just a minute. So, it is also wrong to verbally change the meaning of God's word that it has no effect. So it's okay to tell people what God said if you don't even tell it in exactly the same word. And if they don't read the heaven track and you don't even have a Bible, but you told them that God so loved them. Does God love them? But you didn't quote a verse. Haven't I explained the gospel many times at the end of a church service and never quote a verse, but I told them all seven steps. But I didn't quote a verse. But I told them the truth that is in every one of those points that we explain because there's power in truth and so the devil wants to corrupt truth now galatians chapter 5 verse 4 says christ is become no effect unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law you are fallen from grace so when you believe you are saved by grace but kept saved by the law or that you stay saved by serving God, then you have placed yourself back under the law that Christ died to redeem you from. So, would that be truth or an error? That's an error. You see, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and become not entangled again with the yoke of... Don't put yourself back under the law that Christ delivered you from. And there's people that do just that. And so, no effect. Christ will become of no effect. It's like you're not dependent on the Lord. When you add works to it, just a little bit, 11, I'm sorry, grace cannot tolerate any leaven of works for salvation. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now this is where you have, when people begin to question what God says, a modernist. He's the liberal. And this is where it comes from. Little thoughts that cause you to question the sincerity of the truth of God. Saying what he said, but with a little twist to it. That's what the devil does. And he does it to your mind. Now, Satan founded the that's not what he meant society. You know, as he talked to, he, th th that's not what he meant. God said, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, thou shalt not surely die. Is that a doubt upon what God said? Is that a question upon what God's word says? You see, Bible corruption begins with him. Satan is the original 
Bible reviser. He's a revisionist. He wants to add to, subtract from, dilute the word of God and substitute his own doctrine. Because if Satan has his own ministers, he has to have his own message. And his own message cannot be the truth of the word of God. Satan is a, what is he? A liar. So he's not going to preach the truth. So if you know that and understand it, you'll know that God is not the author of confusion. So, God does not do that to us. He gave us his pure word. He wants us to believe it and to teach it. So we are not supposed to corrupt people's mind by telling them lies. Now, I have to because I am the preacher. And I'm not that brilliant I don't know everything, and I have a a sinful body with a sinful nature, and therefore my mind is not totally 100% perfect. Is it possible that I could say something that I shouldn't say? I can do that. But if I know it, I want to correct it because I know that I have to give account to the Lord for every word. And that's why being a teacher of the Word of God, there's greater judgment according to James chapter 3. So God is not the author of confusion. Now I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark. The book of Mark in chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark in chapter 16. Now if you have an old school for reference Bible, this will make it a little easier to verify but in the middle of this, um, this passage of Scripture, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to the end of that chapter, you'll notice if you have an old sculptor down at the bottom of your, that page, right, right in the middle it says, under number one, written in there is a footnote, the passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in two most ancient manuscripts. The Sinaitic and the Vaticanus. And others have it with partial omissions and variations. But it is quoted by Arrhenius and Hippopolis. uh, Hippolytus in the second or third century. So they say these verses are not in these two manuscripts. And they just, well wait a minute. When When I saw that years ago I thought, you mean that's not supposed to be in there. So this is actually part of the scripture, so I I don't have to believe none of this. And yet right in the middle of all these verses, look what it says in verse 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, why would, why, why, what's wrong with that? Isn't these scriptures also talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't those verses be in there? Now, I will uh, give you just a little bit. Most modern versions... I have a footnote to the effect that these verses are not in the oldest and the best and the most reliable Greek manuscripts. You ever heard that? I'll bet you Bob has. He taught all this stuff. Half God said. Now, if, if it's only in the oldest and the best and the most reliable Greek manuscripts, guess which ones qualify? Guess which manuscripts are considered the oldest and the best and the most reliable Greek manuscripts? You'll never guess what it is. Not in a million years, you wouldn't guess. It just happens to be those corrupt manuscripts. They're the oldest. Oh, they're the best. But they're not the best. They are a corrupt manuscript. So we have over 1,800 Greek manuscripts today that contain Mark 16. The only two that do not recognize this or have the last 12 verses are the two that they mention, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. 99% of all of them manuscripts do. Now, as of 1967, there were 5,255 ancient manuscripts available. Now, there's pieces of all kinds of stuff, different translations and so on. 
but 5,210 go along with the Texas Receptus that underlines uh, the King James Bible. That's over 99% of the evidence. These are sometimes referred to as the majority text because, you see, the others is only about 45 texts that they've even got. But that overrides all of this other evidence. Now, these are quoted from many on the majority text. All these people from all these centuries before we ever had Westcott and Hort come along and, man, finally deliver us. And told us finally the truth that all these, that this is all corrupted and it's no good and they finally got it all straightened out. No, I don't believe that. See, Satan promises to give people a special insight of knowledge that others don't have. This is why you have the Gnostics. They want to uh, delve into uh, the spiritual realm where people don't know what they know. And the Bible is not sufficient. And so there's angels behind the scenes that will give you special insights into other things. Well, the book of Colossians kind of deals with some of that stuff. And it just puffs up the mind. But it reveals no truth. But it corrupts the truth. And so, in John chapter 7, in verse 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. To change the truth into a lie is to make the truth of no effect. Truth is is very important. Our whole life is based upon truth. Truth is the real world. If you don't know truth, you believe a lie. And many people never know the truth. 18 years of my life, I lived a lie. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I came from. I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't know where I was going. I was as lost as a hound dog in the end of a soup bone. And a man brought me the truth. And I sat there and I listened to him. And I finally understood. All I had to do was trust Christ as my Savior. And that night I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I know I have eternal life. And I know I'm going to heaven when I die. So the rest of my life I can either keep believing truth. Or get away from the Bible and believe a lie. And then you'll live a lie. Because you'll believe it. And you will do whatever you think is right and best for yourself. And you'll... Remember, Satan wants to keep you from this book. There's a good statement one of the missionaries made the other day. But my father-in-law told me this uh, about 57 years ago. And it's in the flyleaf of his Bible. This Bible will keep you from sin. Or sin will keep you from this Bible. You want to believe the Bible? It's the truth. So when you read and study and memorize scripture, you're studying truth. Satan wants to get you away from it. And that's where the battle begins with the word of God. So, but God doth know. And this is what he told. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open. Remember he said that to her? Did you know he actually told some truth? Because right after this, he made another statement. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then look what God said. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. So Satan told some truth. But God never intended man to know sin. God never intended man to think sin. God never intended man to commit sin. God never wanted man to know the consequences of sin. God wanted to keep us from that. All that evil. Because of sin. So, yes, now man knows Right from wrong before he were just known right. Now he knows that he's wrong. That's why he knows he's guilty. Because he's violated. That's why we run from God. Because of sin. The guilt. That's what causes so much of the mental problems that people have. Sin. S-I-N. It takes its toll. 
So God never meant for us to know evil, the consequences of sin, which we was talking about this morning regarding repentance. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Why? Because God doesn't want you to do that. Remember what he said about Lot? He says, By seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul from day unto day. By seeing and hearing, he vexed his, like putting a curse upon himself. So he didn't live right, didn't do right, didn't protect his family right. A lot of things you don't do right when you're listening and hearing the wrong things. Ephesians 5, 12 says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. See, there's things God doesn't want people to talk about. If you listen to the news today and all the talk shows, they talk about everything. They bring out all the dirt. It's all built on gossip. True? You know I'm telling you the truth. I mean, because we're talking about truth and a lie, right? So it is a shame. We shall be as gods. Well, independent of the true will of God in the spirit of rebellion. You shall be as God. In other words, you want to be your own God. This is not what God intended. But this is how God corrupted what he said, or Satan corrupted what he said, and then people believed it, and look what the results are. They are putting themselves in God's place and becoming judges on God by judging God's words. Hath God said. Is Satan the inventor, the originator of the... He didn't really mean that, society. You see, that, he didn't really mean that. I mean, there really is no hell. I mean, there is no such place. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to witness. God's already determined who's going to heaven. You ever heard something like that? That didn't come from the Bible. That comes from the devil. Because it's a devilish teaching. It's not the truth. God doesn't love everybody. Yes, he does. When Christ died, he paid for the sins of the whole world. Are there preachers today that teaching God didn't really send his son to pay for all the sins of all the world? And it's a lie. He did come to pay for all the sins of everybody. So in uh, Ezekiel in chapter 11 in verse 5, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord. Thus have ye said, O house of Israel... Get this, this is very important. For I know the things that come into your mind. Every one of them. Does God want us to have wrong thoughts? This is why he never wanted them to eat that fruit off of that tree. Because that was the tree of good and evil. Uh, the tree of knowledge. That they could eat it and they'll know something they would have never had to know. They didn't know sin before, and they did not know the consequences of sin, and now they know all of that, and now they're rebellious, and now they want to play God, and they don't need God. Did Satan do a good number on everybody? All he had to do was corrupt the Word of God. Well, now that we have the Scriptures, well, all of that is truth in the, what we use the King James, but there's a lot of Versions out there, they're changing them. And they all change it just a little bit. A little bit here, a little bit there. And so, the textual criticism is an attempt by man to correct the King James Bible. Because, you see, it undermines the credibility of the Textus Receptus. In other words, the majority text. In other words, the church fathers and what they had and what they believed in, what we have all these centuries later, uh, they want to corrupt that and say, that's not any good. We have some manuscripts that are older and they're better. But they also leave out a lot of stuff and they corrupted the word of God. And I think we need to be very careful. Instead of just using it, the NIV and other translations, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm afraid so. Based on what they consider to be the older and more reliable manuscripts. Now, when you get down to it, 
the people have an agenda. They have an agenda. And uh, this agenda is they are going to attack Jesus Christ. And of course some other stuff. But it will be on the person and the work of Christ. And the work of the Holy Spirit. And that which deals with salvation itself. And so he is subtle. He has a false messenger. And he attacks the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, when you attack the work of Christ and his person, well, how do they do that? This causes you to have questions about it. Remember, if they can just put in just a little bit now, a little leaven, later on, they can say some more. Because, you see, those people who took that and they didn't cause an uproar. Now he can add, they can add a little bit more leaven later on. Take out some more. Put in a little bit more. And after a while, the Bible will have absolutely no power whatsoever. They will corrupt the word of God. That's why what we have, hold on to it and just keep on and using it and don't change from it. Now, they attack the virgin birth of Christ. Now, you think they wouldn't do a thing like that because that's everybody knows that. Well, remember in Matthew in chapter 1, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When is his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph? Before they came together. That means before they lived together, before they had sex together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost by the Holy Spirit of God. So she was a virgin. But they try to say, well, no, no, no. Uh, it, 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 she was just a young woman. Just a young woman. Well, she was a young woman. But now, it's just a slight change, but it's, um, it's recognizable. Now, in the King James, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Jesus was God with us. In the Greek, an unmarried daughter. It's a virgin. And in the Greek, I have been told that there is a specific word that lets you know there is a word for young woman and there's another word that means that that's a virgin. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's what I was told. But I believe it's true because it's a quote from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7 and verse 14. Now, we look in Isaiah 7, 14, and this is where that quote comes from. Therefore, the Lord himself... Shall give you a sign. Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. But in the New American Standard Version. It's behold a young woman shall conceive. Is that a great sign? A young woman is going to have a baby. Most young women do have babies. So where is the miracle sign of that? A a young woman is going to have a baby. Well, in the Hebrew, the word is damsel made virgin. It is not a sign for a young woman to have a child. Most of them do. But when a woman has a child and she's never been touched by a man, she's a virgin. This is a slap at the deity of Jesus Christ. It's just subtle, but it's still there. Now, the deity of Jesus, is Christ, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6, we know. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is called the Mighty God, and the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, whenever you compare the King James with the New American Standard Version on this, When he makes a statement in Ephesians 3 9, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, they got some of it there, and it's still the truth, who created all things. That's true, but there's something missing. Who created all things? Well, God, I think. But doesn't the Bible teach us that it was Jesus Christ? According to Colossians in chapter 1, all things were created by him. In John chapter 1, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
Well, what's the difference about that and us leaving off Jesus Christ? Well, remember, back there in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, who created the heavens and the earth? God. Jesus Christ is God. So when you remove that, you have changed the deity of Jesus Christ. You've taken that out of the issue. It's not even in the verse. Is that? Well, it's just a little thing. No, it's just a little leaven. I mean, it's not big. Just a small thing. Really. The names of Christ and titles of deity missing. And these are how many times that we have Jesus Christ, Lord God, missing out of these two translations alone. Why would you do that? Because they're corrupting the word of God. And if you say, well, that's not that bad. So when they come out with another translation, they're going to have to change that one enough to make it just a little bit more corrupt. But most people will never see it, never know it, and won't be no harm done. But you're losing the power of truth. And that is critical. In the King James, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Well, in the NIV, it says, he appeared in a body. So what's the big deal? Is there any difference? Who is he? He appeared in a body. Well, you can appear in a body, but we're talking about Jesus Christ was manifested. God manifested in the flesh. He was born into this world. It gets even back to the virgin birth. All these things are so important, but it's just little changes to corrupt. And you can read all the other, and all the other stuff says pretty much the same thing. Yes, but there's an agenda. Let me just give it to you this way. Now, let's just pretend. Let's pretend that Donald Trump is the King James Version. And you have the news media coming out all the time with fake news. It doesn't matter what that man says, thinks, does. Nothing matters. He's wrong. Right? He's wrong. It don't matter. They will not be able to find one good thing to say about him, regardless. That's the way some people feel about the King James. It's an old, outdated, translated book, and we have newer, better versions based upon older and better manuscripts. And I have been despised for using this book. I have people who tried to shame me for using this book. And guess what? I'm still using this book because I believe it's the best translation and I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to change my mind about it. In the NIV, you know, we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. The NIV, God's judgment seat. Christ is left out. Judgment seat of God. Christ is left out. See, it's not a big deal until you later on down the road when you try to show somebody that, well, it doesn't say the judgment seat of Christ. What's that? The judgment of God. Oh, that must be talking then about the great white throne judgment. When it's a different one altogether. You see, these words are important, but it corrupts. Now, in the King James, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? In Isaiah 14, verse 12. In the NASB, New American Standard Version, uh, oh, my sorry. The whole verse is gone. Well, there's a, another part of it. Look what's in there. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You have once laid low the nation, O morning star. Now, he said, that's not a big be it deal. So what? He's called the sun of the morning, the morning star. All the same thing. Well, the real morning star in the book of um, Revelation 22, verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. I, 
and the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. You don't take the names of Jesus Christ and apply them to Satan. To me, I think that's blasphemy. When you accept a little leaven, the next translation will give you a little more. And more subtle changes will come. Because if you can accept the one, you can accept some more and some more. See, around the turn of the century, they came out with one and then another one and then another one and then another one. Is it going to stop now? Yeah, I don't think it's going to stop. And they're coming out one now for us, leaving out the gender. You got to leave out gender. You know, where God can be, you know, it could be a him or her. And it's, it's, it's you got to change it. And they're doing it. They already got a Bible line like that. And there will be another Bible down the road. And, it, you know, there won't be nothing wrong with being a homosexual. Because all they did, what's wrong with people loving each other? Because God says there's things to love and there's things not to love. And we can get totally sidetracked, but I'm not going to do that. Attack the work of Jesus Christ. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's the purpose. That's in the King James. But in the NIV, the verse is not even there. That's not even in the Bible. Now, do you see anything wrong with that? Because this is an attack upon the, not just the person, but the work of Jesus Christ. What he's doing. And the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. And in the NIV, and they went to another village. Anything missing? You don't believe me. You just get an NIV. Now don't get it. I dare you just don't believe me. <laughs> but anyway, every bit of this, I checked it with the NIV. Because I want to make sure that if I tell you this is not there and that this is there, that's what it says. And so um, I didn't have anything better to do. In the King James, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. That's a tremendous verse. But in the New American Standard Version, Christ has suffered in the flesh. Did he leave anything out? For us. That's why he did it. For us. You see, and if you can accept that, the next time they were, quote this thing here, uh, they could just leave out Christ and say, he suffered in the flesh. Well, that's not much difference. That's close. And you'd be surprised how much damage can be done. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We, we, we say that every Sunday morning, don't we? Gospel of, I mean, the book of Romans in chapter 1, verse 16. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone to believe it. But now in the NASB, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Anything missing? Yeah. Of Christ isn't there. Good news could be about anything. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a whole lot of difference. But you see, this is an attack upon his, his work. Then there's an attack also upon the atonement of Christ. What he did. He came into the world to die on the cross to pay for our sins. So the NIV, redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The NASV, redemption, the forgiveness of sin. But the one thing that's missing is found in the King James through his blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now why leave that out? They do. They leave it out. You see, these are just little things, and it's not just a couple of words here and there, but these words left out corrupts the truth that is there. In other words, it can give people the impression this isn't exactly what he meant or how to explain it, and next thing you know, you can think, well, how do I know what really to believe? And little by little, corrupt your mind and to... After all, you say, if there's all these versions, who knows what the truth is anymore? It can plant the seed of doubt in people's minds that you really can't know the truth. And the reason that we have the word of God is so that we can know the truth. And the other is designed to cause people confusion. 
And I was in one church and a man used four or five different translations in his sermon. This was one, this translation. And this one here says it better over here. And this one says it better over here. And I thought, I got a King James. I know what it says right, right here. I don't need five versions to tell me what the book says. But anyway, using the right Bible will not guarantee you will go to heaven. You can say, I'm a King James man. That doesn't mean you're going to heaven just because of that. And you'll fight and die. I know people that will fight you to death. But if you don't believe what it says, what value is it? You can go to a lot of homes and they'll have a Bible in their home. Nice, pretty, shiny Bible. The gold edges are still gilded together and they're still sticking together. And they're so proud of that Bible, that old family Bible. There's a family Bible on the table. And they never touch it, never read it, have no clue what it says. Ain't that true? It's better to open it up once in a while. And, because just because you have a Bible and just because you believe this. But you don't know what it says, but I believe it. You still need to trust Christ as Savior. Although we use seven steps in the explanation of giving the gospel, the only thing a person must do to believe is to believe that what Christ did and what he said. And when you believe that, he gives you the free gift of everlasting life. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. The Bible says that we have all sinned. Now, you know, I may not even quote a verse, but when I said that we have all sinned, is that true? It's still true. That's true. We have all sinned. When I say the wages of sin is death, now that's a verse that's in the Bible, but what if I told you the wages of sin is going to church? Now, I just corrupted a truth because what I said is not true. If you want to pay for your sins, all you have to do is come to Calvary Community Church and pay 50%. Now, what's wrong with that? Oh, 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 oh yes. It's, it's wrong. It's in the air. So what I said, see, that was not true. And that truth, see, that I corrupted will not have any force. It will have no power. I must tell the truth. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God, because that's the truth of what the Word of God said. When I say that a man has to be perfect to go to heaven, I may never quote Revelation 21, 27, but I still said the truth. Then I say the truth. Heaven is perfect. And though I'm not even using a verse, I am supposed to tell the truth of the gospel, the good news of how a man can go to heaven. And God says you cannot work your way to heaven. That phrase, you cannot work your way to heaven. I could not show you a verse that says that word for word. But I can show you verses in the Bible that says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So the truth, I'm still saying. So you see, if God does not want truth corrupted. Every one of us in here may tell somebody something about what God's word says. Tell the truth. Speak the truth. Explain the truth. But now, if you have ever done this, you start over here and you tell, you know, Bob something and he whispers and tell him and he whispers and go like, by the time you get over here, it's changed, right? But what is your advantage? You can always go back to Bob and say, is this what you said? And he says, that is not what I said because it changed. That's why you want something that goes all the way back that hasn't changed. And we can always go back to the scriptures. There is... A manuscript, multiple manuscripts, majority text, the Textus Receptus, all the way back. So we have something that we can believe in. Now, the Bible says that we cannot save ourselves, letting this hand represent Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh. Now, whether or not you can find a word in the Bible, the very verse that says, God, Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, I can use some verses and put it all together and explain that, and I can show you that. But I shortened it all up, and I said the truth. This is the truth. Jesus Christ never committed a sin. Jesus Christ came into this world, and he took all of our sins and paid for them on the cross. Now, there's not a verse that says it exactly the way I just told you, but that's the truth of the matter. That's the truth out of the word of God. 
It's the truth that you do not corrupt. When you tell a lost man he has to turn from his sins to be saved, now what have I done? Told a lie. I told a lie. I corrupted the truth. And that lie could cause somebody not to trust Christ as their Savior because they tried to quit their sins and they couldn't quit their sins. And if I tell them you have to promise to serve God and commit your life to Christ in order to be saved, is that the truth or is it a lie? That's a lie. That means I've corrupted the truth. This issue is so important. And there's people that will fight you over using the King James and how them, and yet they'll stand right up and do exactly what the liberal theologians are doing, corrupting the word of God and don't even know they're doing it. Jesus Christ took our sin, paid for him on the cross, came back from the dead. And he says if we would believe he did it for us, he would put this payment to our account. We go to heaven on what Christ did for us. That's the best news in all the world. If I offered you my wallet and you accepted it, what would you have? Yeah, you're getting smart. And if Christ walked in here right now and offered you eternal life and you accepted it, what would you have? Eternal. eternal life. And if it's eternal life, how long would it last? So if I asked you, does this make sense? You know you're a sinner. You realize you can't save yourself. You need to be perfectly go to heaven. And you're not. And yet Christ came, died on the cross, paid for your sins, came back from the dead. And if you'll believe that, God said he'd give you eternal life as a free gift. And if a person believes that, I've given them the truth of the gospel, and yet I may not have quoted one verse. True. So the truth of the scriptures is important. And that's why we've got to have a basis to always go back, because if you don't stay with the book sooner or later, you change, you drift, and you won't even know it. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed. And no one looking around. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you're watching by internet, I pray that right now the best you know how, you would say, yes, I understand. I'm a sinner. Christ died, paid for my sins. And I'm going to accept what he did for me. And friend, if you would do that, he said he would save you from hell, give you eternal life, and you can know that you're going to heaven whenever you die. Would you trust him? And if you will, I'd like to know. If you're watching by internet, the only way you can let me know is by clicking on the little button that says, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. If you're here in the auditorium and you've never trusted Christ, would you let me know by just slip your hand up, put it right back down, say, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Anyone at all. Our Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to love your word, to preach your word, have confidence in it. And Lord, I pray that there's not things that we'll say and do that would corrupt your word but it has its full force of power. And the Lord, we put our confidence in what you have said. We want to live our lives accordingly. Thank you for this church and all that it stands for. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.